Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my quarantine hair. And I would like to welcome you to lecture number 36 of the summer 2020 offering of ECE 3084 Signals and Systems at Georgia Tech. Suppose you find yourself at a party and you find that while at this party, you need to invert this Laplace transform. First of all, you should wonder how you wound up at this party where there's a need to invert a Laplace transform. And secondly, you should probably try to get invited to more interesting parties. So here we have a unique root at minus one, and we also have a double root, a repeated root, at minus two. So in the last lecture, we looked at how to handle repeated roots, but we only had one root that was repeated. Here we also have an additional unique root. So let's write this as a over s plus 1. I can handle the unique root as usual. But we know that for our double root, we'll need to have two terms. So I'll write s plus 2 and s plus 2 squared. And here I'll write the coefficients as b and c. Now, a lot of textbooks would probably call this coefficient b1 and call that coefficient b2, and they'll leave this one as a. But again, every time I've tried to do this with subscript numbers, at some point I wind up getting confused. So I'm just going to go with letters here. So let's look at the first coefficient. The residue method would tell me to take the expression I'm taking the partial fraction expansion of, and to multiply it by s plus 1. Now, at this point, I'm not going to bother writing things like this out in detail because I know what the effect will be. It will be like I've covered up this s plus 1. So in this case, I'll have 1 over s plus 2 squared, and now I'm going to evaluate it at this root, which is going to be s equal minus 1. So that will give me 1 over minus 1 plus 2 squared. Well, that's going to be 1 over 1 squared, which is all just going to be 1. Nothing really interesting there. For the next coefficient I want to solve, I have to remember it's easiest to start with the highest order first. Again, the residue method would tell me to take this expression that I'm taking the partial fraction expansion of and to multiply it by s plus 2 squared in order to get rid of that s plus 2 squared in the denominator. Again, here I'm not going to bother writing out the details because I know the net effect will be to cover up this s plus 2 squared factor, leaving me with 1 over s plus 1, and now I'll need to evaluate that at the root, which is going to be at minus 2. Okay, so I'll have 1 over minus 2 plus 1, which is going to give me a minus 1. Okay, so now going down in powers to deal with this term, I know to take this expression from the previous higher power and take its derivative. So I'll have 1 over s plus 1, I'll take its derivative, and then evaluate that at s equals minus 2. So now I need to remember how to take that derivative. 1 over s plus 1 is like s plus 1 to the power of minus 1. So taking the derivative of this, I'll have a minus coming down from the minus 1, and then that minus 1 and the power would turn into like a minus 2. So that gives me 1 over s plus 1 squared. Now I'm plugging in s equals minus 2. Okay, this is all overly complicated. Minus 2 plus 1 would give me a minus 1, but I square that. So <laughs> there's just a whole lot of minus 1s going on. The net effect gives me a minus 1. That was a lot of work to get a minus 1. Now, the example of using this derivative trick from the residue method to handle repeated roots wasn't too terrible in these examples, but you can easily imagine situations where taking repeated derivatives just gives you more and more complicated formulas, in which case you might be tempted to try something a little more ad hoc. So let me go ahead and substitute in A and C, because these are the things that were easy to find. 
I'll plug in 1 for A, and I'll plug in minus 1 for C. Okay, so now I've got an equation up here that needs to hold for every S. So I could just pick some S, plug it in, and then solve for B. Well, I can't pick any S. For instance, I can't pick S equals minus 1 because that would cause this term to explode. And I can't pick S equals minus 2 because that would cause these terms to explode. But I could pick another convenient S. How about let's try S equals 0. Okay, well, on the left here, I would have 1 over 1 times 2 squared, which is 4. So I've got 1 fourth. And then on the right here, I would have 1 plus b divided by 2 minus 1 over 4. Okay, so on the right, I would have 3 fourths plus b over 2. Um, I could multiply both sides of the expression by 4, which give me 1 is equal to 3 plus 2b. That would give me minus 2 is equal to 2b. And that gives me b equals minus 1, which matches what I got with the derivative trick. So sometimes you might want to approach it something like that. Either way, let's replace the b here with minus 1. And now I can invert the Laplace transforms. So let's write y of t is equal to e to the minus t u t minus e to the minus 2 t u t minus t e to the minus 2 t u t. And later I'll put in my usual for t bigger than or equal to zero caveat. Let's see if we can come up with a more clever way of writing this. I could write this as e to the minus t minus 1 plus t e to the minus 2 t. And this whole thing could be multiplied by u t. And I would write 4 t bigger than or equal to zero. Again, this is usually assumed. I like to explicitly write it because we are remaining agnostic as to what y of t is for t less than zero. If we do write this here, we could not bother writing this ut. That would be fine. And I am sometimes bothered by leaving the ut there because it might mislead someone into thinking that we're saying y of t is zero for t less than zero, but I don't know. I like it there anyway. I may change my mind in the future. Now, it's a matter of taste. Is this expression here actually any clearer than this expression or any number of ways you might write it? I don't know. I kind of like it, but your mileage may vary.